protein, what else? Really, it's fiber. Yeah, some palatability, but as a plant gets taller and taller, it has to put something in that stem to hold itself up, and it does that with fiber. Typically, that's non-digestible fiber that a ruminant can't, can't digest, okay? So that's going to be cellulose, uh, but it'll also be things like lignin. Lignin and cows can't digest that at all. So as we get more stem, less leaf, digestibility goes down, and again, we don't get as many nutrients in the cow. So that's a really good one, leaf to stem ratio. What else? Come on. I figured this would be the first one somebody said. What's the first thing you see when you look at a bell hay? Color. Smell. Did you say smell too? You bet. Smell is a good indicator, but also color. Now, I'll throw a little caveat out there. Most of the time, if you see a green bell of hay, it's probably not going to be super low quality. But don't always assume a brown colored hay is low quality. It can be higher as well. Okay, so sometimes we get things like maybe bleaching from the sun that occurs. It's dry, it's cured, but it lays there a couple days and bleaches. So brown hay is not always low quality hay. What else? There's one big one that I look for when I'm looking at hay. What's that? Okay, so yeah, like Scott talked about when it comes to storage, there's some things we should look at. How tight is it? How is it wrapped? Things like that can make a big difference in long-term storage, especially if you're having to store outside. What about seed heads? Do you want all the seed heads you can get in a hay bale? Why not? What does that indicate? That indicates maturity. So typically on most of our warm season grasses, we're going to start to see seed head emergence somewhere around six to eight weeks. And when that happens, quality goes down. And actually, if you look at the back here on this little chart, You'll notice as we go from the left to the right across that graph, which is time, we see that yield continues to increase, but again, protein, energy, and palatability go down. We'll talk a little bit more about protein and energy here in a few minutes. And again, a lot of that is because of the fiber that's present in that stem, but maturity is typically going to be the thing we want to look for, and the, those seed heads are the way that we can see that in the belt. Visually appraise it, see those seed heads, we know it's hit that mature mark, and we know the quality has dropped. All right, so has everybody judged a class of something before? Livestock or something else? All right, so again, down here at the bottom of the page, we're going to take our time, rotate through here. I want you to put first, second, third, and fourth on each one of these classes. And again, when we, when we look at hay, the reason we're feeding hay is typically because we have a shortage of forage out in the environment, out in our pastures. We need to offer those cows something. But really what I want you to think about is anytime we can offer those cows hay that meet their nutritional requirements, that's going to save us a lot of money on supplementation, okay? And it's really not that difficult to meet a cow's requirements, especially if she's a spring calver and she's going to be dry through the winter. We should be able to do that fairly easily uh, if we're managing that hay crop. Now, for those of you that are buying hay, that's kind of what this process is about. Again, I told you it's a buyer beware market, so you've got to be really careful when you go out and buy that. If you're belling your own hay, the best way to make sure you're getting good quality hay is again, just don't let it stay in the field too long. Understand that at about six weeks, we're gonna start dropping in quality fairly quickly, okay? So a lot of good horse hay producers that bell Bermuda grass horse hay, how often are they belling those fields? What's that? Once a year? Somebody say once a year. <laughs> you gotta get it off there by Christmas. <laughs> about once every 30 days or so okay so about four weeks that's really where we can be high quality even on something like bermuda and bermuda is not one of the best quality forages that we have out there so again just basics of crude protein i tried to put that on there as we do our cow calf boot camps we get a lot of producers that maybe they've heard crude protein they've heard tdn they don't understand fully what that is and we have to meet both of those to meet that cow's nutritional requirements every day, okay? So protein is kind of the building block of the cells. Uh, that's really critical. And when we look at a lot of formulations on rations and things, that's the first thing we look at. We have to meet that. But TDN is really what controls the condition of that cow. 
Is she gaining weight or is she losing weight or are we maintaining her through the winter? That's where TDN comes into play. And all TDN is is total digestible nutrients. It just looks at that fraction of feed that actually goes towards supplying energy to that cow. How many of y'all have ever heard when it's cold outside, give them a few more pounds of feed, put a little energy in them, put a little heat in them? I need a little bit myself right now because my body condition is low and I need some energy. I'm getting cold. But again, that's the theory behind that. And energy is used by the cow for reproduction, uh, again, for maintenance. If she's just out there walking around in the environment, grazing, forages, all of those things take energy. So TDN is vital to that. Okay, so let's walk through this. Before I do, let me go ahead and point that out. In the black box right up there at the top, I kind of put just a real rough rule of thumb, comes from the NRC. If you've got a dry cow, on average, she's going to need about 8% crude protein, 53 to 54 TDN hay or forage. Okay, and that's assuming that she's eating free choice. She's eating all she can eat. If you've got a lactating cow, okay, so that's a, maybe a fall calver, cow with a calf on her side right now, she's going to need about 10% crude protein and about 59 TDN. So that's quite a bit better quality hay we need to be offering those cows. But again, they've got a calf on their side, they're producing milk, they're trying to stay in good shape in colder weather, and that's why the requirements are a little higher. All right, so those of you, the two people who raised your hand said you got every one of them right. I'm gonna hold you to that here in just a few minutes. All right, so let's talk about class number one. Now y'all don't, I'm not gonna call anybody out. I'm not gonna make you feel bad. So class number one, What's first place in that class? Number three? Two? Anybody get number one? Let's walk through these and talk about these real quick. Let me get my little sheet out. That way I'm not lying to you. Okay, number one, that was the one that was down here on the end. Anybody get an ID on what that is? Love grass. Love grass? I get that a lot. The other one is wire grass. Like three on. A lot of people think it might be three on. That's actually a ringer I threw in there, okay? I cheated you on that one. So that was a really good green color and I left that out in the sun for a few days so it bleached. That's actually teff grass. Anybody heard of teff? Okay, yeah. Teff's kind of starting to take the horse hay market. Uh, that sample right there tested 19.7 crude protein, 61.6 .6 TDN. Would we meet a dry and lactating cow's requirements with that? Yep. yep. So again, sorry about that. I had to throw a trick one in there. Number two, that's kind of your stereotypical Bermuda grass hay, right? We don't have a lot of great color. We find some seed heads in there. Anybody pick that as their number one for that class? Okay. That one tested 9.2 crude protein, 58.3 TDN. So really, that's not a bad Bermuda grass sample, right? We're meeting a dry cow's requirements. We're right on the verge of meeting a lactating cow's requirements. So that's not a bad sample, although it wasn't as good as the TEF. Number three, and I apologize to y'all in the back of the room. It's hard to see from back there now, but what was the ID on that one? What'd that look like? You got some cerisa in there? Looks like cerisa, doesn't it? It's actually not. It is a lespedeza. It's common lespedeza. Striate lespedeza. Some people call it Kobe. All right, so again, that's a really high quality legume component. That one tested 14.4 crude protein, 58.7 TDN. So again, pretty respectable sample. And then the last one down here on the end had some big stems. It also had some clover in it. You probably saw that. That was cereal rye and crimson clover. Okay, and I cheated on that one a little bit too. Uh, harvest, harvested that about the first week of April. So there'd probably be no way you could cure that in, in Oklahoma at that time of year. I threw that in a dryer. But that one tested 21.6 crude protein, 73.9 TDN. So while we probably couldn't cure that as hay, why couldn't we strip graze that with cows? And if we're running 73, 74 TDN, and over 20% crude protein, how's that any different than a supplement you might feed those cows? Yeah. It's not, okay? So again, timing is a big part of that. So that's a cereal rye crimson clover. Placings on that class should be two, four, three, one. How many of y'all did pick number two? 
or excuse me, number one as your first place? Huh? Nobody? One person. Took you a while to raise your hand on that. I'm kind of questioning, did you really? All right, well, we got one person that picked a TEF as, as first there. All right, the first place, though, was this one down here at the bottom. Ryan Crimson, number four. How many of y'all did that one? Okay, quite a few. I need someone to help me keep check of them here in just a minute, because now we're going to go to class two. We do have some door prizes, too, if you got these right. All right, number one, class two. Looks a lot like the bells that we've actually got them sitting on, you might notice. Got some foxtail seed heads in there. A lot of different varieties in that. There's actually barnyard grass in here. Uh, there is some wire grass. There's some Cerisa Lespedeza stems. How many of y'all picked that as your class winner? Nobody? That's what we call good Eastern Oklahoma hay right there. <laughs> All right, crude protein on that one, 6.3%. TDN 55.4. So again, we're probably falling short of what that cow needs at that level, even a dry cow. We're gonna be shorting her on protein. See a lot of this from year to year? How many of y'all like that one? Pick that one. Nobody? Okay, good. Yeah, that is wheat. That's wheat at heading. Uh, cut that on May 10th. That was 8.4% crude protein. 57 TDN. Okay. Third one. This one might be a little bit of a trick. Anybody know what that one is? Nobody? Seed heads? It had some seed heads in it, right? That's crabgrass. That's actually Red River crabgrass, okay? Uh, very high quality. Not as easy to cure, but again, if you got the right equipment, you can get it put up. That crabgrass was 19.8% crude protein, 63.7 TDN. So again, that's why crabgrass is a really good forage for cows. Middle of summer, that's gonna give you some really high quality compared to say Bermuda grass pasture or Bermuda grass hay meadows, either one. And then last but not least, I've got this one down here on the end. Anybody pick that one? Nobody picked that one? <coughs> one person fesses up they picked that one. That was probably a good choice. That's actually, that same wheat pasture is right here. But instead of in May, I cut that in March, March 14th. That tested 25.2% crude protein, 71.1 TDN. All right, so again, timing uh, is everything when it comes to this. So on that class there, number four would be first place. You go four, three, two, one. And on the first class, I may have actually said that backwards, should have been four, one, three, two. All right, so who got this on the second class? Who put that first? Raise your hand and keep it up. At first place. Okay, if you also had Tef, keep your hand up. All right, so here's my point from that. How many of us got both classes right? Just the first place, not, not all the placings, but just the first place. We got 100 people here. How many of us got the first places right in both classes? Nobody. You did? All right, we're gonna get a door prize for you then. If you got both of those right. Have you been to one of these before and been through these? I'm just kidding. So my point from that is, if we're going out and buying hay just off visual appraisal, what's the problem with that? We've got all these factors we looked at, color, seed heads, weeds, things like that, but is that fail safe? No, we got full quite a bit, didn't we? And I get full too looking at a lot of these samples. So what's the better way to make sure we're getting a good quality hay? Test it, okay? And if you turn to that next page right up there at the top, I've got our current price list on what it costs to test hay. And again, it's pretty cheap in my opinion. If it's a difference between me saying, well, this is love grass and I'm not buying it, or that's 21% TEF hay, or excuse me, 19% protein TEF hay, it's well worth the $14 to get the protein and energy test, okay? So again, sample that hay before you buy, if the producer will let you. Uh, definitely, if you're belling your own hay, you need to be sampling all your different cuttings. 
What hay do we feed first in the fall? The good hay or the, the lower quality hay? Lower quality hay. Always save your better hay for the middle of winter. Maybe those replacement heifers, maybe those cows that, that do have fall calves, have calves on their side. All right, does that help a little bit? Okay. Let's see, who else? We may give out a few more prizes. What about the bonus? Did anybody get what the highest crude protein was? Highest crude protein on this whole set of eight up here was the wheat. And again, that one started to fade. I apologize. I didn't mean for it to turn brown, but it's, it's about four or five years old. Anybody get the highest energy? Highest energy was the rye crimson at 74 TDN. Nobody? I made that too hard, I guess. Should have put easier bonus questions. So again, when you send that test off, this is pretty much the report you'll get back from the lab. Uh, goes through your county office. Your county offices do have probes that make it a lot easier to sample these bells. We've got auger type probes. We have probes that chuck up into drills. Anybody use those? Those work if you've got a big stout drill. My favorite is the PVC probes, uh, which are simply a PVC, piece of PVC pipe at the back and a sharpened, basically a three quarter, half to three quarter inch stainless steel rod. You can just push them right in a bell. Much simpler to take a lot of samples with those. And again, you need multiple samples. So if we're going up to a hay, one hay cutting, we want to take 15 or 20 different cores out of those bales. Try to get a good representative sample of what we're seeing. Don't go to just one bale and take one core and bring it in. But again, that's a good $14 well spent. Okay, to kind of wrap up and, and to be a segue into our fencing section, I do have uh, just a little bit Thanks, Denise. I do have just a little bit that I want to go over on uh, utilization of forages. Let me take one of those if you don't mind. And as we start handing these around, this is just kind of a snippet out of a much longer presentation that I try to use in our grazing schools. Uh, I've used this for K-State at one of their grazing schools, and it, it's really talking about how we can improve utilization of our forage. And to me, especially on introduced forages, that's that's big name of the game there. Now on native forages, I know a lot of us in here are going to be managing some native, and I'll tell you, I'm not a huge fan of, we're going to be talking about rotational grazing. I'm not a huge fan of rotational grazing on native stands. Why do you think that is? What's that? Labor? Yeah, labor might be part of it, but just by the nature of those native plant communities, what I tend to see is when anybody starts a rotational grazing practice, automatically we think we can run three times as many cows as we did with a continuous graze. And we start to see injury to those native plant communities. They can't handle the grazing pressure that our introduced forages can. All right, so my experience working with producers has been rotational grazing can be a little bit of an issue on native unless you're really going to manage that properly. And there are some who can do that. So again, what I'm going to talk about is just a few of the basics on continuous and rotational grazing here today. And then I'll let you go with Denise and we'll do this uh, fencing demonstration. I guess one of the things when we talk about utilization before we start talking about grazing, what are some other ways, very simply, that we can change utilization of forage? So what is utilization? To me, that's the first question we need to ask. It's how much of that forage we're actually growing and then getting into a cow's belly, ultimately. All right, do we ever get every pound of forage we grow in a cow's belly? No, why not? Trampling, Trampling defecation, urination, Anybody ever had any army worms or grasshoppers show up? There's reasons like that that we lose some. For me, the biggest thing that l leads to reduced utilization is maturity. Again, maturity of that forage. What happens if, if a cow comes up to a mature plant and then a very young regrowth uh, on, on a plant? Which one is she going to grace? The young. And then she's going to walk over here for four or five days and she'll come right back to that regrowth every time, won't she? And that mature plant continues to get bigger and bigger and ranker and ranker. And finally, those mature leaves start to actually uh, rot off the bottom of that plant. So we've lost that production. 
So that is one of the biggest reasons we see reduced utilization in continuous graze scenarios is we have too many plants make it to that mature stage and the cow just refuses them at that point. The cow, she's got what I call cow scent. She goes out there and picks that ice cream grass. What tastes the best, what's the best quality, that's what she's gonna find and she refuses the others. So again, that's one of the things we'll see uh, when it comes to utilization. So how could we better distribute animals or increase utilization very simply on the landscape? What are some ways we could use to make cows utilize more of that forage? What's that? Okay, yeah. Yeah, maybe we could clip it and there's, we can argue one side or the other on whether clipping pays or not. Clawson is gone, so our economist, he's out. He can't argue with us now. Uh, but yeah, we would set that plant back from a more mature stage to a vegetative stage and increase the quality and palatability. So that's a good one. Patch burning. Patch burning, yeah. On, on native scenarios, we're doing a lot of that, and that's almost rotational grazing in a native type environment with no fences. So patch burning would do that. What about water? You think water location changes utilization of forage across the landscape, across a pasture? You bet it does. And the bigger the pasture gets, the more we see that. So a lot of times it's hard to go in and change where our water sources is. You know, building ponds or, or installing water lines. But again, that can change the way cows utilize forage. They tend to utilize more of it close to the water source, less as we get further away. The exact same can be said for mineral locations. And what about supplementation? Have y'all ever, anybody in here use a tub, protein tub in the fall? Have you ever noticed cows utilize that forage better around those tubs than they do half a mile away, three-eighths of a mile away? A lot of research out in the western states and in range-type environments that shows actually moving that tub from place to place gets better utilization across uh, the entire pasture, especially on big pastures. One more thing I think about until we, before we get into fencing, what about shade? You think shade influences utilization? You bet, and again, I know some people are saying, well, Brian, it's hard to move trees, and I agree. I wish I had a few more trees on my place, but movable shades might be an option, or if you're clearing a place, uh, cleaning the place up, maybe think about where that shade is located. Try to distribute that shade out across that pasture to help with utilization. All right, so next we get into the fencing, and for me, fencing is probably, it's not, that easy, it's not that cheap, but it's one of the surest ways to increase uh, utilization quickly, okay? And how many of y'all are familiar with a rotational grazing system? How many of y'all have a rotational system? Most of us in here. Okay, probably one of the biggest misnomers that I get when I'm working with producers or, or doing presentations, a lot of people think that rotational grazing is gonna improve the animal performance of their herd. So they think they're gonna have these fat, happy cows, these fat, happy calves walking around. And I wanna tell you that's, that's a misnomer. That's not true. Typically, rotational grazing is not gonna give you any better individual animal performance than uh, if we had a light, continuous stock, okay? Where is the true advantage in rotational grazing? It's not individual animal performance, it's what? It's efficiency, yeah, it's the, the number we can stock per acre. So it's really a per acre performance issue. And again, this graph does a pretty good job here of showing that as we start to increase stocking rates, gain per animal, gain per individual animal tends to go down. And it's because we're forcing those animals to eat a little bit more of that mature type forage out there. So we're getting better utilization, but we're getting slightly reduced performance from that one animal. But again, we're running more. Does that make sense? Again, it's kind of hard sometimes to picture that, but the graph does a good job. Gain per acre tends to go up. So instead of one calf gaining 300 pounds over a summer, we're now running two calves on the same acreage and they're gaining 200 pounds a piece. So it's more net gain, uh, but again, not as much per animal. So again, that's one of the big misnomers I hear. I've tried to put in here a couple of studies uh, that have been done. There's lots of them out there that just kind of show what you should, should expect switching from a continuous to a rotational system. Most of the time we can increase stocking rate around 50% is a good rule of thumb. All right, so if you're running 100 cows on a continuous stock doing pretty well, 
we should be able to increase that by about 50%. Studies show 30 to 70% based on where we're at in the U.S. So again, the biggest thing that rotational grazing gives us is that increased utilization. And this graph here, and I know that's kind of hard to see, goes over some of those numbers, but a continuous stock scenario, we're only utilizing about 30% of the forage. Many of y'all know that, right? Uh, again, that take half, leave half theory, and then again, the cow's gonna get half of that in her. That's around 25 or 30 percent. As we go to about a four paddock scenario to six paddock scenario, we can bump that up around 50 to 60 percent. And again, to get to that 70, 80 percent utilization, we're talking about a pretty intensive system, much like what you talked about earlier. It's gonna take a lot more labor to get to that. That's the strip grazing scenarios, the mob grazing scenarios. And again, we've got to remember there's a law of diminishing returns where we're getting a little bit more, but it's taking us a whole lot more labor to get to that point. So for me, if I'm telling the producer just starting out, four paddocks, I like a four paddock system, but I think probably the ultimate system with combination of labor uh, and your returns that you're seeing is somewhere around eight to 10 paddocks. This is data that we've used for quite a while at OSU. Uh, but again, for me as an agronomist, you know, I run cattle, but I also look at my forage side of things. It's all about keeping that forage healthy. And rotational grazing does that because you're giving that forage rest, okay? So if you have a continuous grazed pasture, how many days of rest or what percentage of rest do those most desirable forages see in a continuous graze scenario? None, right? Cows can come back to them anytime they want and hit that. If we go to a four paddock, what do you see? How much rest? 75%. So the cows would be on that paddock 25% of the time, off of it 75% of the time. And again, my law of diminishing returns I talk about, if you get down there to 16 paddocks, 94% rest, 32 paddocks, 97% rest. Do you think a forage plant, you think a forage's root system is gonna know the difference between 94 or 97% rest? No, both of those plants, and research shows that, both of those plants are fully rested and recovered. We put carbohydrates back in that crown and in the root. It, it can take another grazing event. What's the big difference between having 16 paddocks or 32 paddocks? We double our labor, okay? So if we're staying on the same, let's say 30 day rotation, instead of every other day, we're now moving every day. So we double our labor to get an extra 3% of rest. So again, that law of diminishing returns starts to take off. Okay, with that, that kind of wraps up what I have. I'm not gonna get, get into the rest of those slides. I tried to do some basic calculations in there off an 80 acre site here in Payne County. I pulled off a soil survey and kind of show you what the basic stocking rate would be for continuous versus a four paddock versus strip grazing. And we do use strip grazing sometimes. I think it's very effective in the fall. How many of y'all stockpile Bermuda or maybe stockpile some fescue? I know there's a little bit of fescue out in here too. Strip grazing works great in those scenarios. And again, we're doing that on some of our research stations. Perkins is one of those right now that they're uh, grazing stockpile Bermuda. And 80%, 75 to 80% is a good rule of thumb for your utilization there. So again, we're getting more out of that grass. And I think that's a big name of the game to make us a little more profitable in the future. Mm -hmm.